On July the 1st, 1846, a young surgeon, Ignaz Semmelweis, took up a job at the world's largest maternity ward at the Vienna General Hospital. Due to the heavy workload, it was divided into two clinics. Even though one of them employed professional doctors and medical students, while midwives worked at the other clinic, it was the first one that had an ill fame. Out of all women giving birth there, between 20 to 30% died of purple fever. However, in the second clinic, the maternal mortality rate rarely exceeded 4%. Semmelweis swore to unravel this phenomenon. In this episode of How It Was, we will talk about the history of obstetrics. You will find out what an ancient Egyptian pregnancy test was like, what caesarean section has to do with Julius Caesar, and why doctors sometimes had to dress up as women to be present at childbirth. We will tell you why and how children were baptized before birth, how queens and ordinary women gave birth, and what they used for anesthesia. But first, subscribe to our channel to not miss out on anything interesting. For centuries, medicine has been strongly influenced by the church, and the church was more interested in the soul than the body. Doctors had quite superficial understanding of the anatomy, superstitions were used instead of knowledge, and many of the ancient healers' achievements were forgotten. Births were assisted by uneducated midwives, they learned the craft by practicing it. The first midwifery schools appeared only in the late 16th century. For centuries, university-educated male doctors and surgeons weren't allowed to be present at childbirth at all, with exceptions only for severe cases. In 1522, Dr. Wirt from Hamburg dressed up as a woman to observe a childbirth. As punishment for this curiosity, the doctor was burned at the stake. And in 1658, the English doctor, Willoughby, had to creep into the chamber on his hands and knees to examine the woman in labor unperceived. With this level of medicine, any complication was equal to a death sentence. So doctor or midwife had to at least take care of the salvation of the baby's soul. In the 13th century, the Dominican friar Albertus Magnus wrote a book for midwives containing instructions on preserving the life of infants for a time sufficient for their baptism. In particularly dangerous cases, the infant baptism ceremony had to be performed while still in the womb. For this purpose, the French obstetrician of the 17th century, Francois Morisseau, invented a baptismal syringe. It was a curved L-shaped tube for injecting the water for the ceremony. To emphasize the sacredness of the ceremony, the tip of the syringe was decorated with a cross. To ensure a smooth pregnancy, expectant mothers, at least those who could afford it, were cared for by midwives in the last months before giving birth. The pregnant woman was advised to avoid unnecessary movements and in the last weeks before giving birth not to leave the house at all. Darkness and tightly closed windows and doors were supposed to prevent the access of fresh, unhealthy air, as it was considered the main source of diseases. The pregnant woman was surrounded with care. If the newborn's face or body shows spots in the form of a cherry, pear, fig or other fruit, it was because of the pregnant woman's imagination or because she wanted these fruit but she didn't get them. This is how dangerous it is to irritate pregnant women, wrote the famous French surgeon Ambroise Paré. Until the 17th century and in some places up to the 19th century, women gave birth lying or sitting on a special obstetric chair with a carved seat, the groaning chair. At first, such chairs were low, as it was more convenient for a woman to give birth with her feet on the floor. But in this case, the midwife had to hunch with her arms stretched forward, waiting for the baby's head to come out. But when in the first half of the 18th century, forceps came into use, the chair had to be redesigned. Now, if necessary, its back could be folded down, turning the chair into a bed so that the woman could give birth in a lying position and the midwife could use forceps more easily. Queens also gave birth in a lying position and in public. Numerous witnesses had to confirm the birth of the heir to the throne. The birth giving of the French Queen Marie Antoinette in 1778 was attended by 200 people. The crowd's pressure was so aggressive that the king ordered the fasten the baldequin with strong cords so that it would not collapse on the head of the queen in labor. But all these inconveniences pale in comparison to the hospital hell. 
Hospitals were for poor patients. In the 16th century, Parisian hospital Hôtel Dieu, where, by the way, a three-month midwifery school was located, there were 1,200 beds, of which only a third were intended for one patient. On the remaining beds, there were from three to six patients at the same time, often together with corpses which weren't carried out in time. Women in labor lay next to infectious patients. Hotel Dieu also had beds for children. In reality, it was eight large beds where about 200 newborns at a time could be placed. Many couldn't endure such mercy and died. However, even a successful birth did not guarantee the mother's life, as between 20 to 30% of women died from purple fever. Doctors were helpless as they couldn't understand the cause of the disease. It was this terrible disease that the already mentioned Viennese surgeon Ignaz Semmelweis faced in the 19th century, and he swore to find out its cause. At first, Semmelweis believed that childbirth fever was caused by emotional shock. He noticed that when someone in the ward was dying of childbirth fever, the priest walked through the clinic past the women's bed, accompanied by the ringing of a bell. The doctor suggested that this frightened postpartum women so much they had a fever which caused illness and death. So, he asked the priest to change the route and come without the bell. But it didn't work. Having discarded psychology, Semmelweis turned to statistics. He compiled a detailed table of the patients admitted to the first and second clinics and found that over the past six years, almost 2,000 women died in the first department and 700 died in the second one. Having focused on the nursing care, he began to copy, down to the smallest nuances, the actions of midwives from the second department, allowing women to give birth lying on the side and not on the back, carrying them to the wards after childbirth instead of forcing them to walk. He introduced regular ward ventilation and increased control over the drug distribution, but all to no avail. On top of that, the tables caught the eye of the higher-ups, and after lengthy investigations, it was concluded that the deaths in the first ward were caused by negligent actions of the doctors. Semmelweis was fired. Besides, he received terrible news. His best friend, medical examiner Jakob Koleczka, died. During the autopsy of a woman who had died of purple fever, a clumsy student accidentally cut Koleczka with a scalpel. Samuelweis realized the corpse particles got through the wound into the blood of his friend and caused sepsis. And women in labor got infected through vaginal tears by students who, apart from the obstetric procedures, also performed autopsies. This was the reason for the different mortality rates in the two clinics. Midwives didn't perform autopsies. Semmelweis cheered up, returned to Vienna and got a job at the same clinic. He didn't suspect that making a discovery is easier than convincing others of its importance. The chlorine solution suggested by Semmelweis completely removed the morgue smell and washed away the corpse particles from hands. On the doors of the first clinic, there appeared an historic announcement. Starting from this day, May 15, 1847, any doctor or student heading from the morgue to the maternity ward is obliged to wash his hands in the bowl of chlorine water at the entrance. Strictly mandatory for everyone, without exception. I.F. Semmelweis. The result was astonishing. Soon, the mortality rates in the two departments were equal. In 1861, with the help of his friends, Semmelweis published a 543-page work on disinfection, the etiology, concept, and prophylaxis of childbed fever, but it wasn't approved by the scientific community. Doctors weren't eager to follow his example, and that's why, when he saw a pregnant woman in the street, Semmelweis would run up to her and beg, when the time comes to give birth, don't let the doctor touch you unless he washed his hands in chlorine solution. One ounce per two pounds of water. Got it? Women, however, also considered their savior crazy. Facing this staggering ingratitude, the doctor went mad indeed. Friends placed him in an insane asylum where Semmelweis died at the age of 47. Paradoxically, the cause of his death was the very same he had been struggling with all his life, blood poisoning. Caesarean section has been practiced since ancient times. 
The name gave rise to the legend that Julius Caesar was born in this way. A more likely version is that during his reign, according to Lex Caesaria, the imperial law, the child of a woman who died in childbirth had to be removed from the womb and buried separately. So the operation became known as a caesarean section. Operation on a living woman was considered dangerous, so a caesarean section was performed only post-mortem if there was a chance to save the child's life. The first recorded caesarean section in which both mother and child survived occurred in Switzerland in 1500. A pig gelder named Jakob Neufer performed the operation on his wife who had difficulties giving birth. She not only survived, but subsequently gave birth to five more children, including twins. As for anaesthesia during childbirth, it was unthinkable for a long time, as it was believed that the difficult and painful labor was the price women must pay for the original sin. The only available remedy was wine, which women drank during childbirth to keep up the strength. On the other hand, a variety of relics was used to ease the childbirth pains, First of all, the Holy Girdle of Virgin Mary, which was considered the strongest amulet. Rich and noble women could borrow for money an allegedly genuine relic from the abbots of churches and monasteries where it was kept. Simpler women used so-called birthing girdles that were kept in churches or even ropes that had hung all night in the church by the icon of the Virgin Mary. In the Georgian era, women already had access to more effective remedy than relics and wine, it was Lord Dunham, a tincture of opium. Besides, Queen Victoria popularized a new pain reliever for childbirth, chloroform. And the final question, when did people learn, or at least try, to diagnose pregnancy and predict the sex of an unborn child? The first pregnancy test appeared in ancient Egypt at least three and a half thousand years ago. According to the Carlsberg Papyrus, the facts of pregnancy and a child's sex were determined with the help of barley and wheat grains. For several days, the grains were moistened with the woman's urine. If wheat germinated first, they predicted it would be a girl, and if barley germinated first, it would be a boy. If nothing germinated, the woman wasn't pregnant. Later, the method migrated to Greece, Rome, and reached medieval Europe, albeit with changes. An interesting fact, in the 1960s, when scientists decided to examine this test experimentally, they found out that even though it was useless for determining the sex of a child, it did diagnose pregnancy quite well. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel to enjoy new episodes of How It Was.